Our next section of work involves gears and we're going to be making a few calculations regarding gears and explaining how they operate. Here is the most basic example of a gear pair. We have a smaller gear meshing with a bigger gear. This is normally referred to as the pinion, the smaller of the two, and this is normally referred to as the gear or the wheel. And as you'll see shortly in a little video clip, if this pinion were to rotate clockwise, its teeth would mesh with the teeth of the gear, effectively moving them this way on the page. So let's draw a little arrow that way, which would mean that this one in turn rotated anti-clockwise. And then the ratio between the two would be in the ratio of the numbers of teeth. The purpose of gears is to transmit power from one rotating shaft to another. In so doing, they are able to change the speed of rotation between the shafts, that is in the ratio of the number of teeth. And in the case of externally meshing gears, it, you can reverse the direction of rotation of the one shaft from the other. Here's a set of external spur gears in mesh in a small winch. And we have 12 teeth on the smaller gear which is often referred to as the pinion. So you can count the number of teeth there, there are 12. And it is meshing with a larger gear of 61 teeth. So if I rotate the pinion clockwise, you'll see that the big gear rotates anti-clockwise. And the ratio that they are going to rotate in, or the speed difference between the two, will be in the ratio of 12 over 61. Next is an example of a compound gearbox. What we have is a small pinion as the driver driving a large gear and connected directly to that gear is a smaller pinion. So these two turn at the same speed and this pinion in turn is meshing with an even larger gear. Now you'll see as I turn the small pinion you can hardly see the big gear turning because of the massive reduction and as you're going to see in the notes, this ratio between these two is multiplied by the ratio between these two to get the overall gear ratio. Full rotation of the little pinion hardly gets the big, this final gear to move at all. But it is moving. If you look closely, you'll see it moving very slowly. Next thing to consider is the shape of the actual gear teeth. The shape of the teeth are in fact involutes of a circle. And involute gears are able to transmit power at what is known as constant velocity ratio. This is very important from a wear and noise perspective. And it also means that the driven shaft will run at a steady speed. If the driver, of course, is running at a steady speed. Now, if we were to build a set of gears that looked a little bit like this over here, they're obviously very crude gears. Let's just pretend for a moment we had two circular objects and we drilled a bunch of holes around the periphery and we pushed maybe dull sticks round cylinders into the holes and we came up with these two devices and we somehow got the two into mesh if i were to rotate this one clockwise yes this one would go anti-clockwise but the contact between the various pegs sticking out of the two objects would be very erratic and the contact point would move around and even if the one were, let's just make this one the driver, for example, if this was driving at a steady speed, turning at a steady speed, this driven gear would speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down, and it would actually manifest as clatter. Okay, so even if this one was driving at a nice steady speed, the driven gear would be erratic, and it would have a constantly changing speed, and that would definitely not be good from a wear and a noise perspective for the machine. So instead, we come up with a better plan, and that is this story of this involute shape of the gear teeth. Now, the easiest way to explain how the involute shape of gear teeth is drawn is to take it right back to basics and draw, as a starting point, a circle of base circle radius. We'll discuss later what base circle radius is. But let's, for now, live with the fact that this circle I've drawn on the page is drawn with a radius R subscript B, standing for base circle radius. Next up, if I were to take a piece of string, I'm going to draw that in green, 
and attach it to some point on this circle maybe glue it on there for example attach it somehow and this piece of string is then wrapped around the outside of this base circle and at the end I make a loop and I put my finger through that loop and I keep that string tight and now what I'm going to do next is I'm going to put my finger in that loop that's made on the end of the string and I'm going to maintain the tension and I'm going to move my finger away from the circle and trace the path that my finger makes on a whiteboard behind all of this and what's going to happen is that string is initially going to have a contact point here at the point of tangency and as I move my finger along this dotted line so that point of tangency is going to move it's going to be there and it's going to be there and it's going to move along until my finger traces a path on the whiteboard and that shape that is emerging over there is the shape that we are trying to draw that is the involute shape of gear teeth so we're going to start off by diving straight into an example where we are going to draw a gear tooth and this gear tooth has a 300 millimeter pitch circle diameter and a pressure angle of 20 degrees we're going to explain shortly what pressure angle is all about but for now just live with the fact that it's 20 degrees and we're going to draw the base circle radius or draw the base circle to the base circle radius now base circle radius is pitch circle radius which is half of PCD times cos of the pressure angle which remember was 20 degrees and we're going to show you in the next few slides how that is calculated but again for now let's just live with that as a starting point so the base circle radius for our example of the 300 millimeter gear turns out to be 140.95 millimeters so what we would do is we would take a piece of paper and we would draw a circle of 140,95 millimeters using a compass and that is this base circle over here and then we're going to do what happened over here with a piece of string except we're going to do it on a piece of paper using actual geometry then we're going to break up a portion of the circle into useful increments and I'm going to make that 10 degree increments so these lines are all at 10 degrees from each other and then I'm going to construct tangents to the points on the outside here so where each of these segments ends I'm going to go tangential to the circle and draw a line tangential to the circle at that point draw a line tangential draw a line and those lines are this piece of string slowly unwinding from the base circle next up we've got to decide how long the piece of string is that is wound around the outside of the base circle from here to here now remember it's not a straight line it is a curve so the easiest way to do that is to consider the full circumference all the way around the circle which would be 2 pi r and then we say it is 10 three of that because remember this is a 10 degree slice of the full circle so that is the step four in the process calculate the arc length of the base circle of each increment so 10 over 360 times 2 pi base circle radius so in our case it works out at 24,6 millimeters which is the arc length from this point to the next point and as the string unwinds from the base circle so this length in total will increase by 24.6 each time so initially when your finger is at this point remember you started over here with your finger on the string and when you unwound to that point you would have this little piece of string touching the base circle at the point of tangency over here and the piece of string would be 24.6 millimeters long by the time your finger got to there there would be two of those little pieces which were arcs or uh, circular paths initially they are now a straight line of twice 24.6 in other words 49.2 by the time your finger got here there would be three of those and by the time your finger got there you would have four of those with those respective lengths constructed on your page as tangents and then you would have this involute shape 
Now once you have that involute shape, you could then construct your actual gear teeth. There is the shape that you generated in the previous step and you would mirror that to the other side of the tooth and you would do the same for the meshing gear on the other side and so on until you had all the teeth on the two gears. And now the two can mesh and they can perform the magic of transmission of power at constant velocity ratio as it's known. And here's how that magic works. If you zoom right in and have a look at this black dot over here, that is the point of contact between this tooth and the, this corresponding tooth on the other gear. So that point of contact is going to move as the two gears rotate and we'll go to this next slide over here where this previous gear tooth is now in this position and its meshing partner over here has moved to this position. Now notice what's happened to this black dot. It is now in a different position on the actual gear teeth. And later it is in a still different position. Okay, so let's have a look at the three. You'll notice first point of contact as we call it is over there. Second point of contact or later point of contact is over there. And final point of contact before the two say goodbye to each other is down here. But the magic is that that all happened along the blue dotted line. So that black dot in the intermediate slides, which are not shown here, simply moved along the blue dotted line. And that is called the path of contact, that blue dotted line. And that is how this transmission of power occurs with constant velocity ratio. And you get a quiet running, smooth running machine. Now before we can carry on we've got to get some basics sorted out and one of those is this relationship between linear and angular velocity something you're going to find in many different engineering machines. So if we have a circular object rotating let's make it clockwise in this case with a certain angular velocity. Now angular velocity is typically measured in revs per minute which we normally denote with capital N that is revolutions per minute which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. You might be less familiar with the unit radians per second which we normally use omega for. So radians per second is the one means of expressing angular velocity and the other means of expressing angular velocity is in revs per minute capital N and Greek letter omega. Now if you have something rotating at an angular speed, a point on its periphery would have instantaneous linear velocity, V, measured in meters per second, and you would find that relationship by either using revs per minute and using V equals pi dn over 60, or you would use angular velocity in radians per second and you would use V equals omega r. Now to try and explain this whole process a bit better, let's try and visualize a real life example of something that rotates and that would be perhaps a merry-go-round. It's a playground device that you'd find in a park or somewhere. And let's view that from above. So here's the merry-go-round which is rotating at angular velocity. And let's make the red dot U sitting on the merry-go-round holding on to one of the railings and you are going around and around in a circle. And at this instant, which we've depicted over here, let's just pretend that you lose grip and you have the misfortune of falling off the merry-go-round. At that instant, you would no longer be attached to the merry-go-round. You would now have left the merry-go-round and you would possess at that instant velocity in a direction tangential to the merry-go-round and the magnitude of that velocity would be pi dn over 60 or omega r. So that instant that you left the merry-go-round you would in fact travel in a straight line in a direction as indicated by this arrow. The misconception is out there that you would be flung outwards the reality is you would actually travel in a straight line. More about that in a chapter we're going to cover in the near future regarding centripetal acceleration etc. 
but for now we need to understand the concept of linear velocity versus angular velocity and it's vital that you note these two formulae down and that is also a good time to talk about this formula sh summary sheet which I propose you start generating for yourself. So aside from these notes I suggest that you come up with a piece of paper you can start as an A4 sheet of paper and you write down for example these two formulae and just alongside that maybe to the right hand side you define each of the variables and you express what their units are and as we go through the course you continually revise this formula summary sheet when it gets a little bit disorganized or messy take a new sheet of paper rewrite it in a more orderly fashion rearrange all the formulae a little bit more neatly and in so doing hopefully you're going to memorize some of these formulae or all of these formulae hopefully because there are going to be lots more coming in the near future. Also on the various slides you'll see YouTube links that I've put down here. Now you can't click on the link obviously in the video but if you go to the notes on Moodle you'll find this link and you can click on it. I strongly recommend you go through each of these embedded videos because they have content that relates to the work that we're doing at that point. Right, next up is to draw the basic geometry of two meshing gears. And that's where we get to look at pitch circle diameters and pressure angles, etc. So we're going to consider two meshing gears of 200 and 300 millimeter pitch circle diameters with 20 degree pressure angle. So drawn at the top is the bigger of the two. This is the 300 millimeter gear and here is the 200 millimeter gear. Now what I need you to notice is that we have two imaginary circles rolling together and making contact with each other at this point here which is referred to as the pitch point. Now the reason I say they are imaginary they do not exist physically on the gear. If you were to pick up a gear and look for the pitch circle diameter you would not see a mark on the gear it would not be visible to you because it is somewhere along the gear tooth. It's not the top, it's not the middle, it's not the bottom. Next is the base circle, which is also an imaginary circle, which you also will not see on the gear. Okay, and the only purpose of the base circle is to draw the involutes from, which we did previously. Remember that was the circle, the imaginary circle that you wrapped the piece of string around and you used to draw the shape of the teeth. Okay, but this base circle is the one that has the contact line drawn as a tangent to those two base circles. So there's the one base circle. If you were to draw tangent to that, a line, it would be this black line over here, and tangent to the other base circle, another tangent point, and you were to connect the two, you would have this black line which is the path of contact which we spoke about a short while ago. And it would pass through the pitch point, which remember is the point where the two imaginary pitch circles are touching each other. Now because the black line is tangent to the base circle, it follows that this is 90 degrees and this is 90 degrees. So if we were to construct a line from the point of contact back to the center of the circle, and we were to then consider this triangle. We would notice that we had a 90 degree there and we would have an angle up here. And that angle would be our pressure angle, which in this case is constructed at 20 degrees. It also means that because of the 90 degrees here, the inclination of this contact path line is at 20 degrees also to a horizontal line in this case. Now the important thing to understand about how the two gears behave is that when the two are rotating and in mesh they behave as though they were two friction wheels rolling together at the pitch point. So let's consider for a moment that there are no teeth on these gears and in fact they are two rubber wheels 
one of 300 diameter and one of 200 diameter, no teeth, and the two are rolling together, they would behave, certainly from a speed perspective, exactly the way the gear is going to behave. In other words, if this one was turning clockwise, this one would turn anti-clockwise, and the ratio of the two speeds would be 300 over 200. But now friction wheels would be able to slip and they could generate heat and they probably would not transmit power as well as gear teeth would. So we then add the gear teeth with that perfect involute shape to each of these gears. Finally, let's consider this triangle over here. And because it has a 90 degree angle over there, we can safely say that cos 20 degrees is... AB over AP. And if we manipulate that formula, we can make AB equal to AP cos 20. And AB is our base circle radius. And AP is our pitch circle radius. And pressure angle psi we'll put in there. And that is how we get the relationship between base circle radius and pitch circle radius. And remember, we use that to calculate the base circle radius in a previous example where we drew the gear teeth. Next, let's just consider the practicalities of how you draw the second side of the gear tooth once you've drawn the first side. Remember, the first side you would have drawn using your string method or the geometry method that followed from that. And you could probably draw this one side of the gear tooth without any problem. But where do you draw the other side? Earlier I just simply said mirror it, or well, how do you mirror it and where do you mirror it about? Well, if you consider the number of teeth in a gear, so let's just make T the number of teeth, and we take a full circle of 360 degrees and we divide it by the number of teeth, that would give us the angle from a point on one tooth to the very same point on the next tooth, obviously on the same gear. So that would be the angle between these two lines, would be 360 over T. If we then take half of that, 360 over 2t, we would have the angle between this line and this line. And that is how you would construct a mirror axis. So if I were to draw a line between those two, I would then be able to mirror this side of the tooth about that line and get this side over here. And so you could do the next one and the next one and ultimately draw the meshing gear teeth. Next, we must look at some terminology relating to gear teeth geometry. We've already discussed pitch circle diameters, D and D, so lowercase d and capital D. Those are the diameters of the two imaginary friction disks, which would transmit the same velocity ratio as the gear pair. Remember, those were the circles drawn here in black. That's the one. That's the other one. So those were the two imaginary friction circles that rolled together. And remember that that was not visible on an actual gear tooth. So you can't see pitch circle diameter on a gear tooth if I were to hand you one. Next is the circular pitch, lowercase p, which is the distance between a point on one tooth measured along the pitch circle to the same point on the adjacent tooth. So if there was another gear tooth over here, and we were to take a point on that gear tooth, on the pitch circle, and measure the distance along the pitch circle to the very same point on this tooth. We would have that distance as the circular pitch. And it's not a straight line distance. It is the distance measured along a curve. Then we get to module, lowercase m. And that is simply the number of millimeters of PCD per tooth. So in other words, you take the PCD in millimeters and you divide it by the number of teeth. Lowercase would indicate the smaller gear or the pinion, and capitals would indicate the bigger gear. And then the base circle is the circle from which the involute curves are drawn. We've already discussed that and it is denoted by R subscript B and R subscript B, capital for the gear, lowercase for the pinion. And that is this imaginary or invisible 
circle drawn over here you can't as we said see it physically on the gear just like the pitch circle you also can't see physically on the gear now we get to parts of the gear which are visible for example the addendum that is the radial height of the tooth above the pitch circle so the pitch circle we can't see but if it were there and we were to pick a point on the pitch circle for example that and measure the distance from there out to the end of the tooth that would be the addendum dedendum is measured from the pitch circle inwards to the base of the tooth now we need to consider when two teeth are in mesh now remember the other tooth is on the other side so it comes down here and it's in mesh now the working depth is the addendum of the other tooth plus the addendum of this tooth and that denotes the, the the distance along the face of the gear tooth where there is going to be contact and that leads us to understand that there is a portion of the tooth which is non-involute the non-working portion of the tooth so this is clearance down here there's never contact in this portion but we have it to make some space and if there's any debris or anything like that between the two meshing gears it could safely exist down the bottom here without causing too much of a problem pressure angle we've discussed already that was the angle between the common normal to two teeth in contact and the common tangent to the pitch circles okay so that's a bunch of big words let's go and have a look what common normal to two teeth in contact means normal means perpendicular or 90 degrees to so the common normal to this contact point would be this line that blue dotted line we discussed before it is normal to this tooth face and normal to this tooth face at the instant where contact is over there the common tangent to the pitch circles there's the one pitch circle there's the other pitch circle the only line that is tangential to both of those would be a line over here okay so the angle between that line and this line which we discussed moments ago would be over here which is 20 degrees in the case of our example which is the pressure angle so pressure angle the angle between the common normal to the two teeth in contact and the common tangent to the pitch circles okay and finally some standard proportions following this spec is that they often make the addendum equal to the module so this little piece here is equal to the module the dedendum which was from the pitch circle down to the base of the tooth is a little bit bigger at 1.25 module which makes the working depth 2m because remember it was twice addendum and finally the pressure angle according to this standard they make all gears 20 degrees and that is the most common pressure angle for gears in use today there are a few old gears that are at 14 degrees but 20 degrees is very common please find these two links in your notes click on them and have a look at firstly how gears are made very informative video showing you how gears are made and then an animated gear arrangement showing how you get gears to rotate in the same direction I'm talking about externally meshing gears and you do that by having an idler between them but once you watch this that will become clear so far we've spoken about the geometry of gear teeth We've talked about gear ratios but we haven't yet spoken about forces between gear teeth now to understand forces between gear teeth let's go back to this slide over here and let's for now pretend that this is the driver turning clockwise and it is pushing the driven which would go anti-clockwise and the only place where there's contact is here where the black dot is so this tooth is effectively pushing that tooth so all the force between the two gears is occurring at this point 
and I think you can visualize it that is a compressive effect because this gear tooth is pushing this gear tooth and between the two is compressive force and remember we denote compressive force with two arrow heads apart from each other which is the symbol showing compression between those two faces now in this particular example it's evident that there are only two gears gear teeth in contact at any one time but you can have with gears that have finer teeth you could have contact already occurring with another pair so sometimes you have more than one pair in contact in this case all the force is between these two because there's only one pair in contact if there are more than one pair in contact maybe two maybe three then the contact ratio is then two or three and this compressive force is then shared between those pairs so what I just said is summarized over here. When two gears are rotating and in mesh with power being transmitted between them, there is a compressive force between meshing tooth pairs. That's what we discussed. At any one time, there will be one or more tooth pairs in contact. This number is the contact ratio. The total pitch line load, PLL, is divided by the number of pairs in contact. And then we will take the nearest lesser whole number, so if you have, for example, 2.3 pairs in contact from your calculations, you would round it down to 2. And that is how you would decide the force between meshing tooth pairs. So the total force between this tooth and that tooth is called pitch line load. And as you can see, it is inclined at an angle. At the pressure angle by the way but if we draw that to scale representing the magnitude of that force in this little force diagram over here we could to ease our calculation we could replace pitch line load with two components one in a useful direction vertical in our case and another in a useful direction horizontal in our case but now we haven't done components yet so at this point i suggest you stop the video and go to your textbook and have a look on page 30 and 31 and try and understand what components of forces are all about that is going to allow you to understand where this came from in the previous section of work we did touch on the fact that torque was equal to force times radius and in our case the gears are also carrying torque and we can also relate force and radius when we talk about gears so the torque in either of the gears is equal to a force times half of the pitch circle radius so sorry half of the pitch circle diameter which would be better known as the pitch circle radius but what force is that going to be well the answer is it is f subscript t which is one of the components of pitch line load. So pitch line load is replaced by FT and FS. And what you learned when you went to your textbook was that any force can be replaced with a set of other forces as long as the force diagram starts where the original force started, follows a path and ends where that original force ended. So this one plus this one equals that one and the reason we split them up is the fact that the two forces that we are likely to need to know for our design are separating force and tangential force and the reason why we're so interested in those two is for, from a design perspective fs is an unfortunate force that we have with gears and that is the force that is pushing the two apart whilst they are transmitting power so this gear is being pushed to the right and this gear has been pushed to the left that force does nothing for the transmission of power it's a necessary evil and it occurs whenever you are transmitting power between two gears it's an unfortunate byproduct of this inclined force if T on the other hand is the one that we multiply by pitch circle radius to work out the torque in the particular gear now to conclude this little section we know that pitch line load is inclined 
at pressure angle which follows that for this little force triangle we have an angle here equal to pressure angle so we can then say that cos psi is ft over pll or ft is pll cos psi types of gears you can click on this link and have a look but there are many different types of gears so far we've only spoken about straight cut external spur gears but you can have bevel gears when the two shafts are at 90 degrees to each other you can have spiral gears in bevel gears you can have a worm gear where this one rotates this way and this gear turns very slowly in a plane offset from it by 90 degrees hypoid gears you can see how they work planetary gears we're going to touch on in a little while helical gears are almost like straight cut spur gears except the teeth are at an angle herringbone gear which is almost like a helical gear but there's one with an opposite angle right next to it and that by the way is to get rid of axial force whilst power is being transmitted internal gears these by the way would both rotate in the same direction if you have one with external teeth one with internal teeth they would both go the same way and a rack and pinion like an automated gate that we see so many of they would have a pinion and a rack a rack is basically a gear of infinite diameter because it's in a straight line and the others we've discussed above now we won't be doing calculations on planetary gear systems but you need to be able to identify what is a planetary gear and that is one where we have certain gears called planets which are able to move themselves in a circular path and that is what's different between this gear set and all the others so what it boils down to is that there are in fact three shafts in such a gearbox where any of the other gearboxes would only have two shafts for example here and here this one to make it work you have to do something to three shafts one can be an input one can be an output and the third one can be driven held fixed or whatever so to show what those three shafts are one shaft would go through and attach to the sun gear another shaft would go through and attach to the arm that is the the device that holds the planet gears and finally a third shaft would attach to the annulus in this case and do something to that rotate it fix it whatever and that is how this this gearbox works three shafts that you've got to deal with and the clever thing about that is if you change what you're doing to one of the three shafts the speed of the output changes so that is a clever way of having a variable speed drive right so here's our first proper example a pair of 20 degree straight cut spur gears with 19 and 40 teeth respectively module 3 millimeter are in mesh externally the smaller is the driver and rotates anti-clockwise at 500 revs per minute whilst delivering 24 kilowatts of power to the larger driven gear make a neat sketch of the arrangement showing the line of action base circles pitch circles direction of rotation and any other geometry pertinent to this configuration assuming that two pairs of teeth are in contact determine the force between meshing teeth faces normal to the surface of rubbing first up is the geometry now let's go through what we were given 40 teeth module 3 millimeters remember module is diameter divided by number of teeth so diameter is module times number of teeth if the module is 3 and the number of teeth is 40 it follows that the pitch circle diameter must be 120 for this this gear which puts its pitch circle radius capital R at 60 and the base circle radius remember is that number times cos pressure angle so that's 
So armed with that and that, you can draw the two circles, the base circle with your compass and the pitch circle also with your compass. Same on the other side, 19 teeth. 3 times 19 gives us 57, putting the radius at 28.5 and the base circle radius at 26.78. So 26.78 radius to the base circle, 28.5 radius to the pitch circle. Remember the two pitch circles roll together at a point called the pitch point. Construct the line of action or the pit, where the pitch line load acts along. Go normal to that. Go back to the center of the top gear. Go down to the center of the bottom gear. Put in your 90 degrees. Put in your two pressure angles. And you are almost done with your geometry. Lastly, put in the direction of rotation of the two and right which is driver which is driven we were told that this one was the driver and rotated anti-clockwise so if it goes anti-clockwise the driven goes clockwise so that is all the geometry sorted out we were told that the smaller rotated anti-clockwise at 500 revs per minute so what speed does the bigger go at well it goes slower and the ratio is 19 and 40. Now if we want to make the number 500 smaller by multiplying it by a fraction, we then have to put the small number at the top and the big number at the bottom to make 500 less. And we come to 237.5 revs per minute as the speed of the bigger gear. Now, assuming that two pairs of teeth are in contact, Determine the force between meshing teeth faces. So here are the two gears depicted as two circles rolling together. Remember those would be the pitch circles. And it's handy to write down the information in the following way. Put all the information pertinent to the smaller gear with the smaller gear and put all the information for the big gear with the big gear. Put common information between the two. Okay, so the little gear, 19 teeth, 500 revs per minute. Big gear, 40 teeth, 237.5 revs per minute. This is the driver, this is the driven. Write that on the appropriate points. Now, what's common to both is the fact that they both must have module 3. Remember, you can't have gears meshing with different modules. So they both have to be 3. And then, very important is, the power that each one sees is 24 kilowatts. They might see different torques, but they have to see the same power, because what goes into the one shaft gets transmitted to the other gear and ultimately comes out of its shaft. And that is, after all, the purpose of gears. Remember, it was for transferring power from the one gear through the teeth to the other gear and ultimately out of the other shaft. See it? as energy flowing in and moving across and coming out of the machine at a different point. That is why the 24 kilowatts is common to both. Now is a good time to get that formula summary sheet out that I spoke of earlier and jot down this formula here. This formula is the relationship between power and torque, one of the most famous or common formulae in mechanical engineering. What that says is the power transmitted in a rotating device is 2 pi times the speed in revs per minute times the torque divided by 60. It can also be written as P equals torque omega. Remember what omega was? That was angular speed in radians per second. So if you choose to work in radians per second, you use it in that format. If you choose to work in revs per minute, then you work in this format. Okay, so torque, if you make that the subject of the formula, is 60p over 2 pi n. So if we want to know the torque in either one of the gears, we simply take its speed as n. We use the 24 kilowatts as the power because we know that's common to both. 60p over 2 pi n would tell us in this case that the torque in the driver is 458.36 newton meters. So what that means is, this shaft on which the driver is attached is seeing 458.36 newton meters. The torque in this shaft 
is going to be greater because this gear is turning more slowly but the same power is coming out of that shaft. So this number will be greater on the driven gear because it's bigger. For this example, however, we don't need to know the other number. We can simply work with one of the torques and figure out what FT is. And by the way, FT is common to both gears because after all, it is the force that is transmitted from the one tooth to the tooth of the other gear. So torque, we already know, is force times radius. Which force to use? It must be one of the two components of pitch line load, namely FT. Okay, knowing the torque, knowing the pitch circle radius of the gear in question, which is the driver, we can conclude that FT is 16.08 kilonewtons. And if you go back a few slides, you'll see that FT and pitch line load tie up on this little formula over here. So you can find pitch line load. And always check that your pitch line load comes out a little bit bigger than your FT because after all it is the longer side of that triangle that you drew a short while ago. And finally, to finish this problem, remember there were two pairs of teeth in contact. We were told that. So the pitch line load is shared between two pairs. So any one particular pair of teeth is only seeing 8.5576 kilonewtons. So that would be the compressive force between meshing gear teeth. Here where the black dot is, these two blue arrowheads, that would be the magnitude of the force. Here's another problem where we have a pair of straight cut external spur gears, 20 and 60 teeth, module 2.5, pressure angle 20 degrees. The larger gear is driven by an electric motor at 1440 revs per minute. The smaller gear is connected to the shaft of a fan. If the pitch line load, PLL, is limited to 20 kilonewtons, what that means is you're not allowed to go over 20 kilonewtons. So we're going to work it out at 20 kilonewtons and see what we get. What is A, the maximum power that can be delivered to the fan? So based on the limitation of 20 kilonewtons, what is the most power we can get through this gear set? And B, the minimum motor power that needs to be specified for the design if the gear efficiency is assumed to be 90%. Okay, so we'll get to that last. Let's make our usual sketch depicting the two gears, putting all the information for the driver, which is the bigger one, with the driver, telling the reader that it's the driver, saying how many teeth it's got, using capital letters, showing direction of rotation, putting its speed down, calculating the diameter, the pitch circle diameter at 150 millimeters, moving across to the driven gear, working out its pitch circle diameter, writing down its number of teeth, and then putting common information where the two meet, namely module, we know it has to be identical for both, otherwise they can't mesh, and pressure angle must also be the same. Now we were told that pitch line load cannot be more than 20 kilonewtons, so let's set it at 20 kilonewtons and see what FT we get, knowing that cos pressure angle is FT over pitch line load, meaning that FT is pitch line load cos 20, so it comes to 18793 newtons. Now with an FT of 18793 newtons, we multiply that figure by 0 0.025, which is the pitch circle radius of the gear that we are working with. And we find that we have 469.85 newton meters in gear one. Now the speed of one is the speed of two times 60 over 20. Let's go through that. The speed of one is the speed of two times 60 over 20. The reason for putting the 60 at the top and the 20 at the bottom is we've got to make the number bigger. Speed of one is greater than speed of two. We know they're in the ratio of 60 over 20 or 20 over 60. We must just decide which. Well, 60 over 20 will make the number bigger and get us to 4320 revs per minute for the smaller, faster turning gear. 
and the reason for wanting the speed of the smaller faster turning gear is because that is the one that we have the torque of meaning that we can find the power so power is 2 pi n t over 60 meaning that the power in number one is 212 kilowatts so our fan can only have 212 kilowatts sent to it otherwise we exceed the limitation given to us however the unfortunate thing about this particular gear pair is it's only 90 percent efficient meaning that some energy is lost in the transfer of power now typically gears are more efficient than that but for purposes of explanation we're going to work with 90 percent so if you are to achieve 212 kilowatts at the driven member in other words where the fan is the fan is attached to this shaft we're going to have to put more in because we are losing some along the way so how do we make 212 bigger with 0.9 well if we multiply it's not going to work so we must divide so we take 212 and we divide it by 0.9 and we come to 236 what that means is we must put 236 kilowatts of power into this shaft and some is going to be lost in the conversion and we are only going to get 212 kilowatts sent to our fan in the previous example we looked at the force between teeth now if we look at the total force on the actual shafts carrying the gears we get a bigger picture of the full story and in example four we have two shafts carrying 20 degree spur gears module three one is directly above the other 19 teeth on the one on the driving shaft and gear b is connected to the lower shaft which drives a winch gear b is positioned midway between the support bearings of the lower shaft okay so that's what we have there gear b is halfway between this bearing and that bearing and directly above it is the other gear gear a we've got to find the forces experienced by the lower shaft bearings if the speed of gear a is 40 to 40 revs per minute and then we must find two other things which we'll get to right the diameter of a is module times number of teeth module is three number of teeth on a is 19 so we've got 57 millimeters pitch circle diameter for that one so the pitch circle radius is 28.5 millimeters and if there's five kilowatts flowing through these gears t is 60p over 2 pi n and remember that the speed of a is given at 1440 revs per minute which means that the torque in gear a and hence shaft a is 33 and a bit newton meters the ft that corresponds to that torque is found as follows torque is ft times r so you can find that the tangential force remember that is the one component of pitch line load is 1163 newtons and obviously that's common to both gears so drawing the setup from the side directly from the side we have the top gear turning clockwise lower gear turning anti-clockwise ft being tangential to the two we already know its value and pitch line load would be inclined at 20 degrees to ft and of course fs the one that does nothing for us it just pushes the two gears apart would be the other component now we look at this little triangle and we can find ft as being equal to pitch line load cos 20. remember pitch line load is always bigger than ft because it's a longer side of the triangle and we end up with one two three eight newtons of pitch line load now because the lower gear is midway between the bearings each will carry half of that so if you go back to the drawing and you have a total of one two three eight newtons between these two gears the total force the inclined force the pitch line load it's got to be taken care of by these two bearings and luckily we are midway between the two bearings so each will take half of the total load in other words 619 newtons 
We were also asked to find the required number of teeth on B if the speed of the driven shaft should be as close to 400 revs per minute as possible. Let's start by trying to make it exactly 400. Now the speed of B is the speed of A times a ratio of 19 over the teeth on B. Remember we want to make this number smaller, so we put 19 at the top, it's the lesser number, over the bigger number at the bottom. So we try for 400, so 400 revs per minute equals 1440 revs per minute times 19 over the unknown number of teeth. That comes out to 68.4. Now we know we can't have 0.4 of a tooth because the gear definitely won't work. So we have to round down to a whole number of 68 teeth being the closest. The last part, C wanted to know what the resulting actual speed would be. Well, we can't have 68.4. We have to stick with 68 exactly. So it means that the speed of B will in fact be 402.35 revs per minute. Close to 400, but not exactly 400. Right, here's our final example for this section. Number five, we're going to consider this winch below. But instead of having a crank handle, which is when we operated it with a human operator, we're going to remove that. And the winch is going to be driven instead by an electric motor capable of producing a maximum of 1.1 kilowatts at 1440 revs per minute. So we're going to attach that straight onto this shaft over here. So the crank handle has gone and the electric motor is now over here and it's connected to that shaft. We are told that all the gear teeth are module 3 and the pressure angle is 20 degrees and we can neglect losses. First off we've got to find the total force acting on gear C whilst the system is running under full load. So let's do that first. Right, the torque of the motor is 60p over 2 pi n. It's a 1.1 kilowatt motor turning at 1440. So that means there's 7.294 newton meters of torque coming out of the motor's shaft. So that's in this shaft here. Now the torque in B will be greater than that because we are in a speed reducing situation, small gear to big gear. So the torque of B is the torque of A times a ratio of the teeth. But we need to make this number bigger because by inspection the slower turning bigger gear will have the greater torque in its shaft. So we put the 40 at the top and the 20 below. Those two numbers are obviously the numbers of teeth taken from the table. So 14.589 newton meters is the torque in shaft B which ultimately is the torque in shaft C or gear C as well because they're common. So the tangential force component for gear C is its torque divided by its radius. Now its pitch circle radius you can find by first finding its diameter which is mt module times number of teeth which is 60 millimeters. Half of 60 is 30 millimeters so the force tangential force component for gear C is 486 0.3 newtons. Now remember that is the tangential force component. The full force is pitch line load which we find with the triangle which we know well by now which consists of FT, FS and the resultant of those two being pitch line load. So we've got to find this bigger one, which we've done a few times before. Pitch line load is Ft divided by cos pressure angle. And we find that the force endured by shaft C is 517.51 newtons. Next is to find the speed at which the load will rise under the conditions described in A. So everything that's happening in A, we've got to find the speed at which the load will rise. So to do that, we've got to find how fast this rope is going to be wound up onto this drum. And to do that, we need a few things, one of which would be the effective diameter of the drum. Now remember how that worked from a previous section of work. We take the drum diameter and we add to it one rope diameter. So there's the rope wound around the drum. And remember, we have to work to the center line of the rope. 
And to achieve that, we've got to take drum diameter plus half rope diameter plus half rope diameter, which ends up being one full rope diameter. And that is how we get to 0.42 meters as the effective diameter. And that is what we're going to use when we work out the velocity of the rope going onto the drum. Next is to work out the speed of the various shafts. Speed of B is speed of A times 20 over 40. B goes slower than A, so it's 20 over 40. We find it to be 720. So both of these are going at 720. Speed of D is further reduced. It's the speed of C times another 20 over 40, which is the ratio between those two. So we're now down to only 360 revs per minute. So if the drum is rotating at 360, because after all it's rotating at the same speed as D, remember that V is pi dn over 60. We discussed that a short while ago. And using the correct diameter, namely the effective diameter, we find that the rope is winding up at 7.9168 meters per second. And it follows that the load is rising at that speed, 7.9168 meters per second. Finally, we've got to find the maximum load that can be raised when the load is 7.86 meters below the winch drum. It's 21 hours. 